Now, as we talk about the types of threats, we're going to look at a variety of different places in which your security could become compromised. Starting off with your computer. Now, by saying your computer, I also do mean your laptop or any portable or personal devices, workstations that you use uh, at your employment. We're going to talk about your habits with the internet, what not to do, what to be careful of. We're going to talk about your own personal security, what you yourself can do to be able to be safer, both in uh, public or while using the internet or using the computer. We're going to talk about being careful about the surroundings that you have with the words that you use. Now, what I'm talking about here are times like uh, when I was sitting in a little restaurant, Denny's, down in the middle of Silicon Valley. And, uh, and around me were all of the big tech companies. I'm not going to name them specifically. And there were people in the booth behind me talking about problems with their firewalls and why they were looking for a new one and what the current issues were. And had I just been making notes, I would have known all about their weaknesses that they had on their internet facing edge just because I was listening to their words. We'll talk about your email habits, the threats that you can have from email as far as the types of emails that you receive, phishing, farming, uh, as well as attachments. We're going to talk about the security threats to your home. Now, I tell a lot of people when we're doing a lot of security classes, especially something like ethical hacking, that one of the things we look for are people who work from home or take their work home. And, and let me tell you why. Generally speaking, when you're at home, you're under less security than you would be if you were sitting in your uh, office. Now, having said that, what we used to do, or a lot of times we would still do as hackers, is try to figure out where those employees lived because we could easily just get in there, plant software on that system. Yes, that's right, talking about breaking into your home. Planting software on that system to be able to eavesdrop on the communications that you're having with your company. So we are going to talk about some of the things we should look at for home as well as your files. What about sharing files? What about emailing them? How do you distribute them? How do you securely get rid of them? And not just electronic copies, but also the paper copies. So when we talk about your computer, there are many types of attacks that can be done against you. First of all, of course, is just did you lock it? Now, this is a big deal. If you think about the places we use personal technology today, not just at home, not just at work, but while we're at the coffee shop, while we're in our car, well, hopefully not while you're driving the car, but you understand what I'm getting at is that sometimes for convenience, we don't lock that system when we get up to walk away or to go do something. Uh, I use my computer a lot on airplanes because we have Wi-Fi now on the planes. So again, locking it means, of course, putting it into a position where no one can access it without your password. Now, something else is a problem with our computers. Not only are we worried about locking it, but did you encrypt the information that's on there, especially on portable devices? Now, I know there are a lot of uh, companies that are selling these cable locks for something like your laptop. And you might have seen those where you can say, okay, this locks to the uh, foundation of the outside of the case of my laptop, and I can secure it uh, like I would anything else, uh, like a bicycle, uh, you'd lock it with the, with the chain. But you know, in reality, as a hacker, I really only care about your data. So yes, it's true that if I were to just try to rip that laptop away from that lock that would probably take part of the system board, that's fine with me. All I wanted is a hard drive. I can take that hard drive and mount it on any other system and get all of your information. But if you encrypt that information, then you're securing it no matter how that theft might occur. Now, having said that, encryption is a big part of what we always talk about with data, and that is securing your information when it's in motion and at rest. Now, I was just talking about it being at rest. We also talk about encrypting our information when we're sending it across the Internet through things like an IPsec VPN or an SSL VPN. Other things, of course, with your computers are, do you scan it? Do you look to see if there are any potential viruses, spyware, adware? There's a lot of free utilities you can download. And we'll get it more into this when we talk about the subject of malware later. But we want to make sure that you're doing something to be preventive to be able to stop the potential of having any type of, uh, of malware that could steal information from you or take actions that you're not aware of on your system. Now, if you encrypt something, a lot of times you need a decryption key. A lot of the commercial products will give you a key on a USB drive. 
Even with Microsoft, they have uh, this great uh, capability now of uh, encrypting the entire drive, including the uh, entire um, uh, operating system, but you still need to have the unlock key. Well, what good is doing the encryption if you're going to put that USB drive in the same bag as the laptop? So we asked those questions. Did you leave the keys with it? I have seriously gone to companies, corporations, some of the Fortune 500s, and I've seen some of the higher ranked people with lists of passwords that they have to keep track of for different uh, software programs that they uh, walk in or have to run. And what does that mean? They're leaving the keys right there on the monitor. It really does happen. So, you know, all of these are things that we talk about, and we're going to get in more detail as we continue on, of course, but right now I just want to make sure you understand the areas in which we have to worry about the threats. When it comes to the Internet, and we're going to talk about end-to-end -end security in a lot more detail, there are lists of known bad sites. Now, what does that mean, a known bad site? That means it's a site that we can look at and see that it has a history of either downloading malware or basically infecting you with malware, and those sites are kept by lots of organizations. I mean, as an example, with Microsoft and Internet Explorer, you have the ability to turn on that filter to be able to keep from going to those known bad sites or at least get the warning that you're going to a place that we already know is suspicious. Of course, we also have to worry about what you're downloading. Now, there's an entire system that we'll talk about to be able to digitally sign files so that you have the trust that a file coming, let's say, from Microsoft is really from Microsoft because of that digital signature. Now, there's an entire world in hacking right now that you can go and download these entire hacking packages. And what they do is they let you build a web server right on your, on your machine, so you can have it right there on your laptop. And you can publish or send out emails with links to your new web server, get it registered with uh, DNS so that people would uh, be able to get to you by your URL. And these websites were designed to be able to hit you with what we call the zero or one day, or I'm sorry, the zero or one click attacks. Now, let me tell you what a zero click attack is. That means you got an email. You click on the URL, you go to the website, and before you know it, it starts downloading files without you clicking on anything. Or maybe you did click on some link, maybe some story or some coupon or some advertisement you thought looked interesting. And of course, that one click then initiates the action, almost like an instant approval by you to download that software. With those, we have the zero-day attacks. The zero-day attacks are those attacks that none of us have signatures for, that our antivirus software is not going to detect. Any of our uh, anti-malware software won't look at. It may be taking advantage of vulnerabilities that the operating system vendors don't even know exist. And those are things that we have to worry about with websites. But again, we know that that's not going to be on every website we go to, but especially those ones that are suspicious. So we want to be able to make sure that we understand what are legitimate websites. And of course, then there's also the false or misspelled URL types of websites. What's a false website? Well, a false website could again be somebody, and it's a part of phishing, where they send you a link, let's say, to your bank. You know, your account's now suspended. You've got to log into the bank. You click the link not looking at the actual URL. It takes you to a web page that looks just like your bank. You try to log in. Maybe you actually get your login redirected to the real bank, but the hackers have your information. The misspelled URLs. Uh, as an example, uh, one time I misspelled Facebook. And when I misspelled Facebook, I had an extra O in the, uh, in the book. It took me to a site that looked like Facebook. But what it was trying to do is get me to log in and make some uh, other type of uh, I guess, advertisements. It was fortunately not very suspicious as far as uh, giving me any software. But I realized pretty quickly uh, that uh, this is not what I expected out of Facebook. And when I actually looked in the web browser's URL header or uh, URL uh, entry, I saw the extra O and I said, I got it. Somebody's taking advantage of typing. We have to worry about DNS spoofing. Well, that's one of the more dangerous things that we have out there. And again, remember, when we get to the end-to-end -end security, we're going to talk a lot more detail about all of these. And right now, we're just telling you about the kinds of threats that I want to make sure you're aware of and that we're going to get into the more detail of. But the DNS spoofing is really hideous because in that case, somebody is impersonating a DNS server. Now, if you're not sure what DNS means, that's the domain name system. When you type in the address of a URL, again, like Facebook.com, your laptop actually doesn't go out and look for Facebook.com. It goes to a DNS server and says, what is the IP address of that web server, of that website? And the DNS server responds with the actual numeric address 
so that you can make the connections. Because again, when we're talking about network connectivity, we're not talking about using names, we use actual addresses. And, uh, and so that DNS spoof would be somebody with a fake DNS server or intercepting your DNS reply and, and sending you a different address. And the reason it's hideous is because your URL on your web browser would still say something like Facebook.com, but you actually wouldn't be there. And you really wouldn't know that you were at the wrong site unless you uh, caught on to something just not looking or feeling or uh, appearing to be the same. Uh, I mean, there are ways to find out, and I'll try to show you some of those uh, by example if I can. And of course, other things about the internet is your online profile. People gathering information about you. Now, in the United States, it's a lot easier to get information about anybody you want. There are some countries that have very strict privacy laws, which in a way is very good for them because those websites can't operate out in the public like they do in the U.S., where I can go to uh, a website and search for a person's name, shows me all their online profiles. From there, I could maybe get phone numbers, email addresses, friends' names, everything I would, my, uh, I would need to be able to begin to impersonate you, or if I was a cyber bully, to be able to start causing you harm. So all of these are the types of threats that we have to think about with the Internet. And by all means, don't be afraid of using the Internet. Just be aware so that you're safe. As far as yourself, well, let's think about security because I've kind of focused on the electronics, you know, the uh, going to the Internet, using your computer, getting the malware. You yourself are at risk for things like identity theft, of having your financial information stolen from you. I mean, think about credit cards. Now, with credit cards, a lot of people have so always told me to say, hey, look, I don't think I want to do any online shopping because I don't know if anybody can get my credit card information. And I try to tell people, I, I say, look, sure, there is the potential that somebody could steal your information from the store that you bought, inf bought something from when you gave them your credit card. That's always a possibility. We've seen that happen a, no a number of times. But the actual communication is pretty well encrypted. So if somebody intercepts that, they're not going to really be able to decrypt it and steal your information. But let me tell how you how they do. At the store register, when you take out your debit card to be able to pay for your purchase, and, and this is true, it happens all the time, you've got that credit card in your hand, you're about to swipe it through that magnetic uh, uh, card reader, and somebody behind you or next in line with you who is looking completely innocent, holding their phone up like maybe they're reading a text, is taking a picture of the number on your card. They can videotape the actions of your fingers and at least get an idea of the pattern or sequence of your PIN numbers. At the bank, certainly there are a number of ATM machines where people have put what we call skimmers, something that looks like a little credit card acceptor over the actual credit card acceptor to be able to do nothing but read your account. And it's not hard to print a new uh, credit card just based on the information that you get from those types of uh, options. And when people say, look, I'm still not sure I want to do anything, any e-commerce, I, and I look at them and I say, all right, well, what about the restaurant? I mean, how often do you give your credit card to a complete stranger? They walk away for five or ten minutes to be able to run your bill. And how do you know they're not doing a double swipe? In other words, using your card for your purchase, using your card for another purchase, or writing the information down and selling those account numbers and bringing it back to you. So... All of those are things that you can think about when it comes to the types of security about yourself that maybe you could still classify as electronic, but I like to think of it as financial. I like to think of it as identity theft, and we're going to talk more about that. Also, beware of the people you talk to on the phone. You know, you might have somebody who sounds innocent on the phone, like they're just simply doing a survey, or they're simply gathering information for some uh, uh, bank that you work with. You know, this happens to me uh, enough times where I'll get a phone call from uh, somebody saying that they're from the bank and asking me to verify information, and I won't do it. And I can hear them getting angry, saying, look, you know, we're trying to provide you this service. You requested it. We're calling you back. And I was like, that's great. I've got the phone number printed on my card. Let me call you, or let me get your phone number, your name. I'll call you after I can verify that I'm calling the right location. Because people can certainly fake their caller ID when they call you, uh, and you, they can certainly impersonate somebody that you might think is supposed to be trustworthy. So, back to the question, is online shopping safer? Well, for many of the things I just talked about, how easy it is to steal your credit card information when you're using it at the store or from an ATM machine or at a restaurant, 
And of course, with those of you with the uh, uh, cards that you can just basically tap against the machine, that uh, somebody walking behind you with a chip reader can be able to get all that information without even talking to you. Yeah, I think online shopping is safer. The biggest problem we have in the online shopping arena these days is either you falling uh, the victim to a fake website or people actually hacking the uh, institution that you did the purchase from. Now, I talked about your words, especially when it comes to a, a part of hacking that we'll uh, look at, which is called social engineering. I gave you the story about uh, my time at the Denny's restaurant there in the middle of Silicon Valley and uh, about that lunchtime conversation. We have to be careful about the things we say when it comes to our digital security or even our personal security that other people might be eavesdropping on. Another story I like to tell people is when I was at a cellular phone store and the uh, one person working there couldn't help me because their computers were down. And they were waiting, yes, waiting for a technician to come in. So I'm there looking at the phones, wondering what one I want to get, and the technician makes it into the store. And then over the counter, he yells, what's the manager's password? And the person working there, who was not the manager, was able to tell him that password and yelled it back across the store. Now, all right, maybe I don't have the best memory, so I might have thought to myself, well, okay, if you don't have a good memory, maybe you didn't catch that password. But then she told him the way in which he created the password. It was the uh, name of his favorite basketball player along with her jersey number. And I was like, okay, now this really makes it easy for me. And I can go on and on with uh, stories like this about your words, about being at a major airline uh, airport in the baggage claim, listening to them use walkie-talkie unsecured communications to tell them the logon name and password for the baggage claim system. I, I mean, it just again, your words and what you say, when you think that it sounds innocent and you're just trying to be helpful, what happens with the real hacker who has purposely positioned themselves in places where employees meet to try to get this information. Again, the phone solicitation. A lot of your uh, actual social engineering is going to be on the phone. Somebody calling to get information from you, pretending to be somebody of importance, or pretending to be a customer trying to gather information, or working uh, at another location uh, if you have a, uh, maybe a multinational corporation or a corporation with offices across the country. We have to be careful about how we react and what we say on the phone and have a way of uh, verifying the people that we're talking to. Your, your words through written form in email requests, again, be, being careful of what you send and what you say. We're going to talk a lot again about that end-to-end -end security, so we'll talk uh, more about the hazards of emails. And uh, again, talking to colleagues, uh, you know, when you're talking about even internal things, uh, with uh, you know, privacy information within your corporation. You might be privy to information that not everybody is supposed to have disseminated to them. And other people eavesdropping on a conversation of where maybe you are supposed to talk to somebody about uh, some sort of uh, high security uh, information, somebody eavesdropping can hear that as well. So it's just, uh, again, a matter of being careful about security information that you're giving away, whether in written or verbal form. Now, I did say we're going to talk more in detail about email, but I want to just give you kind of the heads up because, again, we're talking about the types of threats that we have to worry about. One of the big ones is phishing. Now, phishing is, again, that somebody sending you a, a, a email from your bank, and you say, okay, this says my account's overdrawn or my account's being suspended. I got to log on. I got to fix that. And you see the link for your bank, and you click on that, and it opens up to a web page that looks exactly like your bank but it's not. If you were to pay attention to the link you were clicking on or paying attention to the actual URL that shows up in your browser, you would know right away that it was not the actual bank. And so you have to be careful about the uh, types of things you see in emails. Now, companies like Microsoft have done a lot with their email clients like Outlook to try to take those links and make them unavailable to you unless you go out of your way to say, okay, I trust this site. Again, for that very reason, trying to protect you. Now, what else can we do besides phishing and making a, a fake bank? How about if I send you an email that says you just won a $100 shopping card for use at whatever store, XYZ? And you're like, oh, okay. So you go click on follow that link and you're, you're excited. And it says, okay, we need to have your name, your address, and some other information about you to be able to, uh, be able to send you this card. And, of course, that just means that what are they doing? They're just now, with a fake site, advertising something that you really can't verify as even a legitimate product or a legitimate gift, 
um, or something you won, you're giving them all your personal information. Remember, I also said that those sites can do the zero or one-click attack, which means suddenly before you know it, you might be downloading malware, and you're like, hey, I didn't download that. Now, this very thing happened to me years ago when I was in the city of Boston at a hotel downtown getting ready to take a flight the next morning. I went to the hotel's login page just to be able to go and sign up to use the Internet. Somebody had hacked that site, and as soon as I hit that login page, uh, malware started downloading. That's actually adware. And I started getting all these adult websites popping open all over my screen. Now, it took me most of the night to clear that out. Uh, and it was just a waste of my time. It was fortunately not more malicious, but I also knew I had to fix it because I had a presentation the next day. And I think the last thing I need on a big 30-foot screen in front of hundreds of people is to have all of these adult types of sites showing up. That was a zero-click attack, and that was at least seven years ago when that happened. So, um, I, again, you just have to be careful about the sites that you think you're signing up to get something for free. Farming is another way of which we try to create fake networks to be able to, again, try to encourage you to divulge your secrets in what you think is a uh, safe place. So we'll look at ways to prevent that and ways to be cautious as we uh, get into more detail. Now, I made mention already about your home. Maybe I caused a little paranoia because I talked about the fact that serious hackers will break into a home not to steal anything, but to implant software on your systems, to be able to gather information electronically while you're away and not there to protect it. We also know that a lot of us at home are using Wi-Fi. And in the Wi-Fi world, we have to, again, be careful because anybody within range that has a radio could intercept those signals. So we look at different methods of encrypting that signal so that you're safer with the information. We also have to worry about the fact that visitors may be there, wanted or not, on your Wi-Fi, meaning that they're utilizing your wireless network, especially if it's unsecured. I know that happens frequently with people as they're uh, going around. In fact, there's this whole world of uh, what we called war driving. This was big 10, 15 years ago when Wi-Fi was starting to get popular. And they would drive around cities to look for uh, what we called open access Wi-Fi spots. And then they would draw little symbols on your mailbox or if there was a business on the back of the business. So somebody driving by would see, oh, here's the open Wi-Fi spot. They could stop there, get on your network. I, I know a colleague who was working with a company that was doing something I thought was quasi-illegal. The company's not in, in business anymore probably because it was. But they were going around to companies in downtown L.A. And they were purposely breaking into those Wi-Fi networks, stealing documents, no, not even stealing, just copying the information going back and forth, coming in the next day to give them a quote on how to secure their networks. So, you know, you have to think about those types of uh, access to your, uh, your, to your home. Uh, your own backups, of course. Now, one of the things we will talk about later on is uh, the way in which we can protect our information from the loss or the change or alteration of data. And so we're going to take a look at uh, the different types of backups, and, of course, your decryption scheme. If you're not using it, you should because, again, data that is important to you should be what we call, again, safe or secured in motion and at rest, at rest on your hard drive, at rest on your USB drive, wherever it is, the de decrypted file keeps that file safe. Obviously, if you, if you lose the decryption uh, key, you're also in trouble. But, uh, again, we'll get more details. We talk about that uh, ways in which we can secure our information. Now, I just mentioned backing up, and that's important for your files. But the other part of backups are what type of storage and how long do you need to keep those? I mean, do any of you listening to me remember the days of 8-track tapes? Or for that matter, cassette tapes? Or for that matter, uh, you know, I, you get in the picture, right? We had different ways of storing digital music, but those ways are gone. If you have an 8-track tape and it had your favorite songs, I challenge you to find a way to be able to read that information without going to maybe some old uh, uh, thrift shop or something and getting an old player hoping that it still works. Uh, and that's going to be something we have to think about when you think about the longevity of your storage. So when I say types of storage, of certainly, of course, it could be DVDs, it could be removable media that uh, is not, uh, you know, uh, kind of a right once like a DVD. Uh, it could be portable uh, hard drives. It could be cloud storage. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can look at. But it's important that you understand that uh, a part of security is being able to have access to your information over a long term, especially if it's accidentally deleted, especially if it's uh, accidentally altered or changed, or purposely if somebody or some malware 
uh, made those changes, you need to know that you have that uh, backup capability. And again, I've said it enough times, and I probably will continue to say it, encryption. Now, there's a lot of encryption schemes. Microsoft Windows comes with encrypted file systems just for you to be able to encrypt things that are on your local drive. Now, a lot of you might say, well, hey, that's okay, Ken, because, hey, you know, they don't know my username and password. And well, guess what? I don't need your username and password. If I want to look at your files, I can just boot your computer to a different version of Windows, one that's on a DVD-ROM, one that's on my USB drive. If I bring up my copy of Windows, then I can log in with my personal username and password, and then I have full access to everything on your drive. But if it's encrypted, I still can't decrypt it. RSA uh, is another type of an organization that uses a very strong encryption scheme. And, uh, and so we have to think about why those are important. And again, the theft of drives. I don't know how many stories I've heard over the last few years, uh, like uh, somebody from the VA having their laptop stolen on the back of the uh, car without encrypted information, resulting in the potential of millions of people's of, uh, private information, social security numbers, having been uh, given away to those who want to do the identity theft. Uh, again, FBI losing information that had uh, very important uh, details on cases. Uh, I remember about one bank who uh, had their backup tapes. They were going to do the right thing. They were going to take the ba the, their backups of their data that was on tape and ship them to an off-site facility because we, we like them to be in different buildings, and we'll talk about that later. But those tapes never made it to their destination, and they used a reputable shipper. Well, they didn't panic because they knew the data on the tapes were encrypted and that it would take years, potentially, for that information to be of use to whoever stole it. Now, the odd thing is, this is a side note, I went to do some work for that bank about a year and a half later, and I asked them, whatever happened? And they said they found them in some rural farm at a, in the back of a barn that the uh, driver had just delivered and dropped the boxes there. So, um, uh, just amazing, whatever happened. But they weren't, like I said, they weren't that worried about the theft, because of the encryption. So you should also be worried, though, about theft of information. Uh, oh, and something else that's really important, the uh, digital rights management systems. Now, this is a cool thing that uh, we're seeing a lot more use of, and that is now I'm giving you a file. But not only is the file encrypted, I'm not going to give you an actual a decryption key. I'm going to have a system that's set up that if you can authenticate with my system, username and password, you will get a temporary use of a key to be able to look at the document that I've given you, plus have control over whether you can print it, copy it, uh, or, you know, do screenshots of it. And uh, again, this is uh, getting so much more prevalent because we're worried about piracy of information, uh, piracies of songs or movies. I know with many companies I use where they send out their training manuals, they're using a secured PDF type of uh, arrangement. It's so very much like an RMS to be able to make sure that the people who get those can't just put the, uh, the, the you know, very valued information up on a BitTorrent site for just anybody to download.